Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbert brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Good evening, friends, and uh, let me pop on up here and welcome you to Nightcast for this April 23rd, 2015. Last night, in opening this the program for the 22nd of April, we mentioned the Calbuco Calbuco volcano in southern Chile, which had erupted twice in the space of a few hours. This volcano lay dormant for decades. What you're seeing on the screen now is time-lapse footage from the area that shows a huge column of lava and ash being sent several kilometers, several miles into the air. The authorities have declared a red alert, a red alert, and evacuated more than 4,000 people within a 20 kilometer, that would be about a 12 mile radius. And so there's our video on that for tonight's opening. Friends, for our, our next story relates to things happening in Europe where European leaders have committed extra ships, planes, and helicopters to save the lives of migrants in the Mediterranean. The measures which were agreed at an emergency summit in Brussels in, and I'll tell you why this is a very important story related to prophecy about the coming fifth seal, the Great Tribulation, which revolves around a seventh head of the Holy Roman Empire being crowned and the revival of that Holy Roman Empire. But in Brussels, they voted uh, uh, on measures that include tripling of the money available for search and rescue. David Cameron said Britain would send a Royal Navy flagship, but he went on to warn that those rescued would not be able to claim asylum in, in the UK. That could run amok with what the EU is going to say because it has oversay over the UK when it really comes down to the bottom line. But uh, one of the things that are causing these countries that usually, and, and you're going to hear in this video, how there is, there has been, uh, oh, a lot of disagreement between the various parties to the EU. And yet, for a moment, even though they really don't want all this mass migration, they're voting to fund it in a certain way. And it's caused by the large number of deaths involving migrants crossing from North Africa which the number is now believed to have reached more than 1,700 this year. For this video report, here's Katya Adler. Ended here, in unmarked coffins. They are just a few of the hundreds who died at sea this week. You know, friends, Given I'm, a number. I'm going to stop that for just a moment because we, uh, we clipped the audio at the beginning of that, and so... Let me recycle it, make sure the audio is on, and let's go for this report again with Katya Adler. A journey made in hope ended here in unmarked coffins. They are just a few of the hundreds who died at sea this week. Given a number, no name, there was no one left to identify them. No one to mourn for them, except other migrants who survived a sea journey of their own. The coffins were laid at the feet of European officials, whose countries scaled back search and rescue missions last year. They said that would put migrants off making the journey. These deaths have changed their minds. Mourners here said it was a clear moral choice. And I'm here to cry and beg for the world to stand up for, for once, to stop fighting, stand up and wear awareness for humanity. Europe's leaders arrived at an emergency summit in Brussels today under urgent pressure to save lives. A minute of silence for all those lost at sea focused minds from the very start of the meeting. Immigration is a sensitive issue and divisive. 
So leaders today concentrated on something they could easily agree on, while touching on more complex issues. EU countries agreed to treble the funding and provide more ships for the maritime mission in the Mediterranean, back to the levels of Italy's former search and rescue program. They want to target traffickers, making money by putting desperate people's lives at risk. There's talk of capturing and destroying their boats, but few details yet as to how to do it. Then there's what happens to migrants after they reach Europe. Leaders remain at odds over whether refugees should be spread more equally amongst EU countries, but they agree to work on a speedier way of expelling economic migrants. Hey friends, that's one of the points I, I wanted you to be sure and get, that uh, there was, uh, they, they, they weren't agreed, and yet all of a sudden because of these deaths they came to a, a sudden agreement. And uh, I actually have... Uh, there's the Russian, the Italian prime minister speaking, but I've got a video I want to cut to from the news conference in Brussels where the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, outlined the measures agreed to by the, the uh, EU leaders. Let's you cut have over been to that video now. With Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Here's Donald. Donald. Whoa. All right, friends, I'm sorry. I actually, while I was talking to you, I cut to our, uh, our closing instead of our screen I wanted to put on. What I want to cut to now is uh, some video that I have of Donald Tusk, the president of the European Council, in which Mr. Tusk is outlining the measures agreed to today by the EU leaders. First... Leaders have asked the High Representative to propose actions in order to capture and destroy the smugglers' vessels before they can be used. Naturally, this will be in line with international law and respect for human rights. We will step up cooperation against smuggling networks by working through Europol and by deploying immigration officers to third countries. Second, we have agreed to triple the resources available to Triton, our border mission in the central Mediterranean, and to enhance its operational capability. The mission will continue to carry out its mandate and respond to distress calls where necessary. I am happy to announce that leaders have already pledged significantly greater support, including many more vessels, aircraft, and experts and also money. Third, we need to limit irregular migration flows and to discourage people from putting their lives at risk. This means better cooperation with the countries of origin and transit, especially the countries around Libya. Finally, we will do more on refugee protection. The European Union will help frontline member states under pressure and coordinate the resettlement of more people to Europe on a voluntary basis and with an option for emergency relocation. For those who do not qualify as refugees, we will operate an effective returns policy. Okay, friends, and you know, the, this story, let's put our chart up on the screen for a moment. This story relates to uh, this this whole story, both videos that we op uh, sh just showed, the last two videos we just showed, relates to the coming fifth seal, the Great Tribulation, because at this time, during the Great Tribulation, it'll be the time when, uh, let's go into this this chart on the, on the screen, it'll be the time when this crown of the Holy Roman Empire is worn by the seventh and final head of the revived Holy Roman Empire. Now, the EU or uh, United States of Europe will have to reshape itself so that its borders are redefined or else just 10 countries or nations are, are whittled down into what becomes the United States of Europe, a complete federation or just a reshaping of this present EU, so that there's five from the east and five from the west that give their power to a dictator, an emperor, who will be crowned by the pope, who will work in consort with this dictator, this emperor, the seventh head 
of the Holy Roman Empire, the seventh and final head of the Holy Roman Empire. And it'll be the time of round three of World War. It'll be the time of a great martyrdom of God's saints. The Jews and anyone, anyone doing anything Jewish appearing at all, like keeping the Sabbath, refusing to work on the Sabbath, refusing to bow down before the image of the beast, will cause them to become anathema with the beast power, and they'll be martyred. And yet now those who are praying and watching now praying always and earnestly about the things we see in the news now, the things that relate to these first four seals from the Revelation 6, from the book of Revelation, praying with all your heart, as Christ <clears throat> says to do in Luke 21, verse 36, if you're watching and praying, he says, <clears throat> you will be accounted worthy to escape all these things to come. Now, what's to come after the fourth seal? Well, the next major thing to come that'll last two and a half years, and that'll put, that's biggest focus, because then after that, the sixth seal, if we widen out this chart to show all of the, uh, show all of the seven seals from Revelation, the sixth seal is the astro signs, the heavenly signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. Then there is a sealing of 144,000. And then the seventh seal, which is synonymous with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not one day of the week. It is a, an entire one-year-long period because it's a prophetic day. And in prophecy, a day is as a year with God. And so this is a one-year period following the two-and-a-half-year period of the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. The sixth seal will be very quick, very sudden. Uh, signs in the sun, moon, stars, boom. That's a dramatic image. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's in the sky, boom, it's a big sign. And it's a... It's a segue, part of a segue, between the fifth seal and the, the seventh seal. There's a little pause before the seventh seal starts for the sealing of 144,000. And then, uh, then there's a period of silence for a half hour in the heavens just before God says, go ahead with the four winds, which are the first four trumpets of the seventh seal. The seventh seal consists of seven trumpets, and then the seventh trumpet itself consists of seven something else, seven last plagues. So the seventh seal is seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpet is seven seals. That's where you get your seven, seven, seven. And following the four winds, there are three woes. And after the first two woes, on the third woe, Christ returns, and this, he unleashes the seven last plagues as part of that, what that third woe is, and that third woe is the seventh trump, the seventh trumpet. Synonymous, third woe, seventh trumpet, same thing, Christ returns on that seventh trumpet, which is the last trump, and that's the picture of the whole ball game there that, you know, uh, that relate to these seals in Revelation. But for right now, and I'm just mentioning that's the whole ball game. But, uh, you know, before the day of the Lord occurs, there's a two-and-a-half-year period that's, that, as Christ is mentioning in Luke 21, verse 36, that, you know, watch and pray about these first four seals. When you see them become extremely active, know that, that like when the branches of a tree become tender and the buds start to to spring forth, you know that summer is nigh. He said, likewise, you know the kingdom of God is near when you see these seals become extremely active, and then he says, he says, you can escape all these things that are come. Well, the next thing to come, the next major event in prophecy is the fifth seal, which is the Great Tribulation. And that's what he's saying. You can escape that and be accounted worthy to be taken to a place of protection, nourishment final training. Some of you will understand what I'm saying by that. Some of you will say, what's all that about? Well, stay tuned and tune in with us on the weekend, and maybe God will call you to understand that, which he's blinded much of the world from being able even to understand. 
But I want to mention that because I want to keep you mindful, especially those of you who do understand, keep you mindful that, hey, we shouldn't become so involved with things of this world when all these things are starting to become active in the way they are. European Union becoming more and more involved with things and in the daily news and shaping up in this event, even this migration event thing is causing them to be able to start to come together. And some event is going to cause them to say, you know, we really need one strong leader. And as God tells us, he uses the Assyrians to punish his people. And one thing about the Great Tribulation, it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's Jacob's trouble because of the principle in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, because Jacob is disobeying his creator again. And whenever Jacob has done that in the past, and I'm talking about the descendants of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, who had 12 sons, they're called 12 tribes in the Bible. Ten of them became known as the house of Israel, the other others, the other two, and sometimes three, depending on how you count them, have become became known as the house of Judah. And... Uh, the ten became lost, but their being lost was only until the latter days because through Jacob, God told us, as he told his, as Jacob told his sons in Genesis 49, he told us where those tribes would be in the last days. And all you have to do is read Genesis 49, look at the circumstances around the world, and it's pretty easy especially with God's Spirit, unless you're just absolutely blinded, it's very easy to see, oh, wow, this is where all these tribes are today. Because this is Christ said this is the conditions under which they'd be located during the latter days. It's a prophecy given all the way back to the time of Jacob as he talked to his sons from his deathbed and told them what would befall them and where they would be in the last days. But here in the United States, where one of Joseph's two sons, Manasseh, is located today as the modern-day descendants of Manasseh, uh, a country whose pride is being broken because of its extreme disobedience to God. I say extreme because when you start to, when a nation starts to legitimize through its laws, and not truly legitimate, but passes laws sanctioning sodomy, an act which God hates and finds so perverse that he sent fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. And sodomy is simply an extension of the name of the city of Sodom where they did these perverse things that people in the United States are, are doing wholesale now and the laws of the United States have began to, um, I guess the best word to say is sanction as if it were legal and yet it's a stench in the nostrils of God and God warns if you as a nation continue in this kind of disobedience, ultimately as God prophesied through the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 6, verse 6, Ezekiel 6, 6, very easy verse to remember. He says, all your cities will be laid waste. Now, before that, he says, uh, in punishment for disobedience, as Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 for a long time have been known as the blessing and cursing chapters. The first half of each of those two chapters, again, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, the first half of each of those two blessing and cursing chapters start out by telling, announcing expressly in some detail what the blessings will be if you as an individual and collectively you as a nation will diligently hearken to the voice of your Creator and obey His commandments, His statutes, His judgments. Then halfway through the chapter, God says, on the other hand, if you disobey, then all those things I named as blessings, just the opposite of that will happen. It'll be curses upon you. And if, if you continue to disobey after I begin the curses, then I will increase the curses seven times. And if you still continue to disobey, as God says in verse 
19 of Leviticus 26, I will break the pride of your power. You'll have power, but the pride of it, your ability to use it, will be broken. In this next story, friends, this relates to that. The United States has announced that two hostages were killed in a counterterrorism operation in the border region of Afghanistan and Pakistan. The two, Warren Weinstein, an American, an American, and Giovanni Loporto, an Italian, has been held by Al-Qaeda for several years. The family of Warren Weinstein criticized both the American and Pakistani governments for their lack of assistance after his capture. We've got video report on this with Gary O'Donohue. In his statement, the president said they had hundreds of hours of surveillance uh, of this target before they hit it. Well, it does raise the question, if you'd had hundreds of hours of surveillance, how could you possibly not know that there were two pretty high-value hostages on that site? The other things I think that people will ask about is uh, the extent to which the families were supported through this process. We've had a, a statement from the family of Warren Weinstein that uh, pays tribute to certain members of Congress for, for their support during this the sort of four years that he's been in captivity, but also says that they have been disappointed at the lack of consistency at the help they've had from other parts of the U.S. government. And we do know that the U.S. government is already looking at the way it supports families of those who are held hostage, uh, and they've admitted that uh, they don't always get that particular bit right. This was an operation carried out in January. Why has it taken so long to actually emerge that this is actually what happened? We don't know exactly what the process has been here. I mean, the intriguing thing is that uh, the Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, was, was here last week at the White House. So uh, uh, presumably he would have been told at that stage that they had suspicions that an Italian national had died in this raid, though we don't know that. I think the difficulty of getting intelligence and, and hard facts out of that part of the world, that border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, we know how lawless that part of the world is. We know that it's, no one's rich really runs there. It's difficult to get that, side, that sort of information out in a categorical way. So I, I imagine they wanted to be absolutely certain. And of course, if you're if you're wanting to talk to the families and tell the families what happened, you need to know for sure uh, that, uh, that your facts are right. So I imagine that's the reason for it taking so long. I think they would also have wanted to try and get some idea about how they got this thing so wrong. Uh, and also to, to verify the fact that they are now saying that they have killed a couple of Al-Qaeda operatives, both American citizen, citizens, one of them a pretty high value target, Adam Gadnan who uh, has appeared in a number of videos with the Al-Qaeda le leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri. So he was a pretty big target for, for the US. Uh, so they will be saddened and disappointed that they got these hostages, but they will be pleased that they got him. Hey friends, we do have video in which the United States admits two hostages killed in Al-Qaeda raid. This morning, I want to express our grief and condolences to the families of two hostages. One American, Dr. Warren Weinstein, and an Italian, Giovanni Laporto, who were tragically killed in a U.S. counterterrorism operation. Warren and Giovanni were aid workers in Pakistan devoted to improving the lives of the Pakistani people. After Warren was abducted by Al-Qaeda in 2011, I directed my national security team to do everything possible to find him and to bring him home safely to his family. Friends, that comment right there illustrates, does it not, with the United States, the President of the United States saying he's done everything in his power to find these, a big nation with an NSA and a CIA like the United States has, does that not illustrate what we were just saying, what God says in verse 19 of Leviticus 26? I will break the pride of your power if you continue to disobey me. And friends, you can blame it on your president and the shoe fits and he should either wear it or have a few thrown at him. 
But really, when it comes down to it, it's not just your president. It is the entire country, with a few exceptions. But if the exceptions refuse to stand up and be heard, you know, one of the judges from a federal court the other day ruled in favor of a, we gave you the story last night about how the MTA, the New York Bus Metro Authority, was trying to prevent a very uh, perverted ad from being shown about Muslims are being encouraged to kill Jews. And the judge said, well, under free speech, this can be done, and, and I'm approving it because uh, nobody really stood up and got excited and no terror happened and there was no big reaction against, against it. I can guarantee you if the opposite were the case, if those signs, instead of saying Muslims kill Jews, if it said Jews or anybody else kill Muslims... There would have been a, an extreme reaction by the Muslims and then the judge using that principle of, oh, well, people are all excited and uh, this is causing a big problem. Now, okay, you can't put those signs up about killing Muslims. I'm just doing a hypothetical. But you got to know that's the way it would go down. But because nobody stood up and made a, enough noise to attract the judge's attention, he said, I'm going to, you know, no, no harm done. Uh, excuse me, you know, um, that's murder. <laughs> that's allow, That's Talk about hate speech. Christ said if you even hate someone in your heart, you've committed murder. And a sign that encourages Muslims to kill Jews, that's hatred and murder. That's not hate speech. That's considered freedom of speech by this one judge. Friends, we've got a nation that's turned upside down, topsy-turvy, and when the bombs hit... As God says they will, in Ezekiel 6, verse 6, all your cities will be laid waste. When those bombs begin to hit the cities, just be aware. Some of you federal judges will be uh, partly responsible for that, and the rest of us who didn't stand up and speak out and be heard against it, or who failed to speak out against such perversions as marriage, so-called, by men of this government, between man and man and woman and woman, that's the most perverse thing in the world. That is not the way God, who designed marriage, that's not the way he designed it. He designed marriage to be, to be between a man and a woman who can produce children together and who can raise that child with a father who gives a child a sense of what our Heavenly Father is like and a mother who gives that child a sense of what God's church should be like as a mothering institution and a loving institution that shelters and mothers the kids, even when dad may be holding a strong handle against them. They run to mom, get a little loving. You know, they can run to the church and get some loving when God's got them in a disciplined situation. And it works real good that way, you know. But you put two people of the same sex together, this poor kid's got a perverted idea of what, of what God was trying to get across about what family really is like and what it should be. But back to this story. Unnamed officials told Associated Press the attack that killed the hostages was a CIA drone strike. Friends, I've got an interesting story from Facebook, but I'm going to save it tomorrow till tomorrow night because I want to end tonight on this story. Uh, when I say tomorrow night, I really mean our next nightcast broadcast, which will be Sunday night. We take a break Friday night and Saturday night from our nightcast program. And we do a little special program on the weekend. Some of you know about that. It's on a different channel. And uh, that we try Sunday night. We sometimes go a little longer and cover Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday in Sunday night's program. God willing and the creek don't rise, we plan to be back here on Nightcast Sunday night. And uh, I do want to play that Facebook story for you then because we're having to make some changes on Facebook at the request of Facebook. From uh, we use We use it to put our headlines and let people know 
hey, our broadcast is up if you didn't get a chance to watch it live. But I want to thank you for joining us for this Thursday night report, friends. And God willing, the creek don't rise. We'll be back again here on Nightcast Sunday night. Excuse me, Sunday night with the current news related to the Bible and prophecy. Until next time, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying good night and so long, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.